Final Fantasy XII. Square's epic 2006 adventure is not just one of the greatest video games of all time. It's also one of the most democratic. I know we don't usually think of the word democracy in the context of mythic worlds of swords and sorcery, but hear me out on this. For decades, role-playing video games like Nintendo's Legend of Zelda, Square's Final Fantasy, Blizzard's World of Warcraft, and Sony's EverQuest have enthralled millions of fans. But role-playing games also had a problem. Until recently, their audience was limited to about a billion people on our planet. That's only one in seven of everyone on this planet. Enter Final Fantasy XII, the game that changed the game. Twelve did something no other role-playing video game did before. It openly confronted the colonial legacies and the neo-colonial complicities of its genre. Though indeed I am our emperor's son, I am no prince. Arcadia's emperor is freely chosen by her people. I am but an elected official and nothing more. It also dared to criticize the ideology of neoliberalism fancy word for the rule of the unelected thieving and corrupt plutocrats who drove the world economy off a cliff in 2008. With that much nethocyte in one's grasp, you could destroy all of Ivelis if you wished it. What makes Final Fantasy XII special is that this is one of the first video games for the 99% of planet Earth. Its story is about all of us. Brazil to Russia, China to India, Indonesia to Nigeria. If you're a citizen of this planet, this story is about you. How did they pull this off? One of the hardest things to explain about video games is just how complicated they are. For film, you go watch it, then you're done. For concerts, listen to the music, then you're done. This is not how video games work for three reasons. Hmm. First of all, video games are multimedia experiences. They combine sound, images, text, voice acting, script writing, and a thousand other things into a single package. Second, video games are interactive. They're playable experiences, and that makes them fundamentally different from most other media forms. Third, Video games are tied to persistent game worlds. And what that means is they're built just as much by fans as by commercial studios. That makes video games deeply subversive. Video games are accountable to fans in ways that many other art forms are not. Now here's the kicker. For a video game to be great, it has to excel at all three of these categories. Video game may have great characters and story, but it'll still fail if it doesn't have a good soundtrack. May have a great soundtrack. It'll still fail if it doesn't have good performances. May have great performances, but still fail if it doesn't have solid gameplay. Final Fantasy XII is a great video game because it excels at everything that video games can do. Let's take a closer look at each of these categories. First of all, multimedia. Who are you? I play the leading man. Who else? Fran, the Magicite. Now then, I'll take that. No, you won't. I found it. It's mine. And then when I take it from you, it'll be mine. Uh, uh. Final Fantasy XII is a feast of multimedia. It contains some of the greatest music, some of the finest set design, some of the most amazing voice acting. Exit stage right. The gods do not smile on us. I like it better that way. And remarkable performances, and some of the great storylines ever created for the digital media. 
You didn't kill my brother. It was the Empire. It was indeed the Empire, but we'll come back to this issue a little bit later. Interactivity. Final Fantasy XII does a number of new things here. Number one, it abolishes character classes. Character classes are job specializations. They're one of the most obsolete hangovers of what I'd like to call the imperial era of role-playing video games. And that's when certain characters are locked into certain skills and professions for no very good reasons. Final Fantasy XII changes this by democratizing skills. Any playable character can acquire, in principle, any given skill. You have to work hard to get those skills. You have to use something called a license board, level your character up. Secondly, Final Fantasy XII democratizes gender. It has genuine gender equity. This is for that bread you took the other day. Just because I help Miguel out every now and then, it doesn't mean that you get to eat for free too, you know. You have three female playable characters, and you have three male characters. There is no difference between them. You can level up whatever characters you wish, each of the female characters is a strong, interesting character in their own right. They have their own storyline. They're strong, independent characters. Each of them is very interesting and can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the men. And it's wonderful to see a video game finally get gender equity right in its game world. Thirdly, Final Fantasy XII has a wonderful gambit system. It, this is a way of automating routine forms of gameplay. It's a little similar to play calling in professional sports where you set the play and your players carry out specific operations. You don't have to worry about the individual tasks. They know enough to carry out certain things. The Gambit system was an important step forward in transforming gameplay from a kind of a micromanagement system to a much more seamless system that allowed for greater player customization and choice. Now the final issue of Game World. Final Fantasy XII has a wonderful game world, the mythical fictional world called Ivalice. And Ivalice is a double critique. It's a critique of Final Fantasy's own previous game worlds, game worlds that were generally limited to science fiction or classic fantasy tropes and didn't delve deeply into history. And the second problem is a lot of the game worlds drew heavily from the J.R.R. Tolkien playbook. And there's good and bad there. Tolkien created a wonderful world. However, Tolkien's world is deeply sexist, deeply racist, deeply xenophobic, and saturated with tropes of British imperialism. That's a structural problem that later artists have always had to wrestle with. Final Fantasy XII responds to this by creating a multicultural world. Ivalice is full of all these different cultures that communicate, there's equity between them, they talk with each other, they do not exploit each other, but they come together in various interesting ways. And secondly, there's a cross-racial romance at the heart of Final Fantasy XII, and this is the romance between the characters of Fran and Balthier. How are we supposed to get through that? Making an appearance? Come on, I'm talking over here. I thought you'd left for good. Hey! Our choices are few. Fran? Balthier! This is as much for you uh. as it is me. Oh? You are ill at ease. The nethersite troubles you. You've let your eyes betray your heart. That's right. These two sky pirates are an item. What this enables Final Fantasy XII to do, which I think eluded earlier video games, is it allows the video game to critique Empire from the standpoint of gameplay itself. It builds this critique into gameplay rather than bringing it from outside. And the result is that your accumulation of skills, the way that you level up your characters, you acquire mastery over the items of the game world, and over how to move around and operate in the game world, that becomes a metaphor for autonomy from Empire. In fact, the real villain of Final Fantasy XII is not some demon or stereotypical villain, but actually the whole system of Empire itself. And in effect, Final Fantasy XII rereads Empire as the prehistory of neoliberalism. It's, it's taking all the classic fantasy tropes and thinking, you know, this really isn't about prehistory long ago. This is about our own struggles for autonomy, for democracy, for representation and participation in a very unfair and oligarchic world where the 1% hold most of the power and all of the money, and we have to fight against that. What that democracy looks like, how we could actually struggle against the 1% and win, that is a subject for the next video. <laughs>